All right, well, let's get started. First off, um, my question for you, Travis, is how's retirement life treating you? Retirement life has been great. It's been uh, interesting. You know, it's definitely different. Uh, but I think it, everyone's lives are a little bit different right now, uh, especially when you look at the guys that are getting ready to go into training camp. Uh, things are way different than they than they once were. So uh, everybody's life's been shaken up, and, and mine's just been shaken into retirement versus uh, shaken back into fall camp. Travis, what's the one thing, if you can narrow it down, the one thing you miss the most? And the one thing that you're happy to have back the most? The thing that I miss the most is definitely being around the guys. You know, I think there's just a, a sense of camaraderie that is always um, apparent. And then the, the shared sacrifice is something that, that I'm definitely going to miss. You know, the, you don't get a lot of opportunities in, in, you know, normal life to be in situations where uh, you could get hurt or, you're constantly playing through pain and you're, you're doing things. And, and that kind of shared sacrifice really brings you really close to, to a group. And so I'm going to miss that. But, uh, you know, the thing that I am so happy to have back, is just my health and my time. Um, I, I, I didn't, I didn't realize what kind of shape that I was in. I always felt like I was in good shape and, and ready to go. But, you know, since I've been able to, to relax a little bit and, and, lay off the weightlifting a little bit and, and do a little less of the banging. My body and my joints have, have started to feel so good and I can tell a difference. It allows me to run around in the backyard and kick a soccer ball with my son and, and do those types of things that I wasn't necessarily doing before. So uh, that along with the time that I get to spend with the kids and my wife and, and my family back up here in Wisconsin, it's it's been good. I'm really enjoying it. You know, uh, you've retired from football, but you haven't retired at all from doing things in the community. And let's talk about the Blocking Hunger Foundation. Uh, and especially during this pandemic, what a worthy cause this is. You know, I knew as soon as things started to, to shake up in March that something needed to be done. The kids were not going to be going back to school after spring break. And I know that the breaks are times when kids are in the most need because Luckily, while kids are in school, there are programs available for them to receive food when they're not able to otherwise. And so when you're out of school, you lose access to a lot of that. So we wanted to try and do everything that we could to help. You know, our cyclic programs are set up around certain times of the year, you know, because we plan on kids being in school, just like everyone else is planning on kids being in school. And uh, so it, it's kind of a dire time. And we found that one in seven children have lost access to food. So one in seven children that had access to food have lost it now during COVID-19 as well. So the need continues to grow. And so we're doing our best to help in any way that we can. And one of those ways is working with our partners over at Sharing Life and continuing our backpack programs where we provide backpacks of food for children during this time. And also our food pantries in the schools. We have four food pantries now. Those pantries have been able to stay open throughout all of this. So kids have still been able to come to the school and get, you know, out to the car deliveries of food that they were receiving during the school year. So we're really pleased with the amount of access that we've been able to, to help with, but there's always more. And, and for us, you always have to continue to work on fundraising and, and programs to be able to continue those. And so that's where our moving to moving the chains to block hunger fundraising campaign came from. You know, we can't be meeting in person and, and doing events right now uh, for fundraisers. So we thought we'd try something new and, and do an online fundraiser where we ask people to to join in and, and be able to help our cause out. And I'm happy to say that we've met our goal already and we've raised over $29,000 so far. And uh, the campaign is set to end tomorrow, but what we're trying to do is get as far ahead of that goal as we can so we continue to make a bigger impact and go beyond our, our set goals of being able to help feed all of those children. Travis, I know a lot of times uh, players, they connect themselves to causes based on personal experience and, uh, and a lot of times how they've been adversely affected by something, uh, whether it be uh, breast cancer or whether it be lung cancer. In your case, it's making sure that young people have enough to eat. You were a first-round draft pick of the Cowboys in 2013. You officially started your foundation four years later. Where did your emphasis on helping young people make sure they have enough food, where did that originate? 
I think, you know, I was really fortunate to grow up um, with parents that taught me to the importance of giving and doing. And so I, I had that going on. And then up throughout college, we did a lot of outreach programs and things like that. And I knew that when you play in the NFL, you have an ex- a tremendous platform to stand on and, and speak about something. And so coming into the league, I knew I needed to speak on something. And I didn't know exactly what that was going to be. And um, for me, the the aha moment was when I was working with another company and I was in downtown Dallas and handing out food. And there was people coming through the line and they were just so happy to be receiving that, that meal. You know, they were so thankful for it. And then you started to see children come through there and, and they don't know. They just don't know any different and they don't have any there's nothing they can do about it. You know, it's just the situation that they're in. And, and a lot of times that's the situation for adults too. And so seeing those kids really broke my heart. And so that's when I started to put the wheels in motion. It took us about a year to get things up and running off the ground. Uh, but that's when we decided that childhood hunger was going to be uh, a really important cause for us and try to do make as big of an impact as we can, especially in the Dallas Fort Worth community. You know, you see when you're a young football player and actually in general, you get invited to a lot of these charity galas because you can go and sit and people will help donate money and you can help raise money. And so I saw the tremendous generosity of the people in the Dallas Fort Worth area. You know, there were so many people that wanted to help. And there was also this huge problem that I saw when I was downtown. And so I said, what can I do to create a conduit between all of that generosity and the people that, that need help. And so that's why the blocking hunger foundation was started. And, you know, that's where we really wanted to go. And I think one of the things that was really important to me throughout the whole process was making sure that we were reaching children that weren't previously being assisted. You know, it's really easy to go and and sponsor a program and put your name on it. You know, the, the blocking hunger, you know, donation, Um, But if those kids are already getting food, you know, it's already happening. And so what we try to do is go out and actively find children that would go home and not receive any food and make sure that they got it. And so I have a responsibility, you know, now that I'm potentially leaving the area, I'm no longer playing for the Cowboys. That doesn't mean that I can just stop giving and stop helping in the community because those kids that are now receiving food that weren't will go back to not receiving food. And that's just something that I'm not going to be able to tolerate. And so uh, for me, I, I just want to do as much as I can to help uh, spur the community and, and rally the community around these children and try and help as much as I can. And really, with the with, uh, schools not starting in class uh, here coming up in August and September, I, I would assume with the virtual learning going on that, that the need is going to be even more great uh, come the start of the school year, right? It is. You know, like I said, when kids are out of school, it makes it really difficult. And uh, luckily, since they're doing some of the virtual stuff and schools have been able to plan for it a little bit, I think there is a little bit better response uh, around the USDA programs and finding ways to help deliver that food or make it available for pickup. So that has been that has been helpful, um, but it's it's not going to be 100 percent. It's not the same as kids being able to go into school and get that, and whether that means that parents don't have the time or can't go get the food or um, don't feel like they feel comfortable going in and getting food. There, there are several reasons why they may not. So we just have to continue to do our best to try and make an impact and try and help those kids out. Will you be a steady presence in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, even though you're alluding to you and your family moving back to your home state of Wisconsin? Will you be a steady presence here still? I anticipate being around and, and trying to be in the area. You know, Dallas gave me so much. You know, I was so fortunate to get a chance to be down there and play for a great organization, but really live in a great area and a great city. And not only did we feel welcome there, but we felt like we learned a lot in, in living in that area. And it's just, it's different. And I, I think you, you learn as you experience different things. And so and we're really fortunate for that. And so we continue to feel that pull uh, to be in the, in the Metroplex and be around. Um, and we're certainly we, we definitely still have a ton of friends that are one on the team and two in the area. Uh, so we're, we're definitely going to be back around. And I really hope to, once things kind of settle down and we're able to start doing in-person events again, you know, be able to do some in-person uh, blocking hunger events where hopefully I can t- convince some of my former teammates to come out uh, and, and be able to do some more of these fundraising type events and, and try and make a, a bigger impact yet. As camps are starting right now, uh, how much, do, how much do you miss being with the team? And secondly, uh, the second part of that, uh, I, I don't know if you've noticed uh, around the league, there's a lot of reports of opt-outs, uh, especially a lot of veteran players uh, because of the, the health conditions, uh, the obvious during this uh, pandemic. 
Um, uh, what are your thoughts as camp uh, gets going here? You know, camp was always an interesting time because as, as excited as you are to get into the season and go and, and be with the guys, it also was a time where you spent a month away completely from your family and uh, you faced some difficult circumstances during that time. So it was always sort of a, a bittersweet time. And uh, it, going into this time of year and, and feeling like I'd be going out there right now, um, I definitely miss being around the guys and I know that this would be the time that everyone gets back together and that first day when you're back in and you see everybody and you catch up about what you've been doing over the summer you know those are those are fun times um but I I really can't imagine what it would be like uh right now in the situation that they're in and I know that uh, they're doing everything that they can to keep things contained and try and keep the players and the coaches and the staff members as safe as possible um, but there are just so many unknowns you know we just don't know a lot about how the how this virus behaves and, and interacts and how how you can contain it and stay safe and so um, you know I certainly understand a lot of the people that are considering their health and and trying to make sure um, that they stay safe by opting out um, but I also completely understand the people that are are going to continue to go and are going to continue to play you know there's a desire to go out and play um, for multiple reasons and. You know, as long as the protocols are in place and they're being followed and, and doing what they can, you know, that's that's about as much as you can do. Travis, one of the things I've always my, admired about you is you were one of the most cerebral athletes I've come in contact with since I came to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So I'm going to ask you to appeal to not just the common sense proponent, but also the highly intellectual proponent. Is it ridiculous for us to think that all those bodies can be smashing together in a locker room, on a field, players, staff, coaches, equipment, and, and can that really happen under these circumstances? Is it a pipe dream or do you think it's realistic? I think there are certain things that will allow it to be more successful. You know, you have to think about um, – that, that those, those types of contacts are going to happen um, and you're going to be sharing. I mean, they're going to do their best to isolate. And, you know, for me, I, I was a big towel wiper. I sweat a ton. So I was always wiping a towel and you share that towel throughout. And so I'm sure that the, the situation now is you're, you're not sharing towels and you're doing your best to stay as clean as possible. And um, you know, all of the different things that, that they're going to be trying to do. But, you know, ultimately I think it's about trying to prevent, you know, the, the exposure from the outside, you know, and it, and it comes down to responsibility of the players and the coaches and the staff members to try and limit their exposure from the outside. You know, because I do think that once, once it gets in and somebody has it and you're having those direct contacts, um, there's just, there's just not a lot of situations in football where you can prevent yourself from being in contact or doing some of the things, you know, you shouldn't be touching your eyes and your face and, you know, when you're, you're sweating all over, you're trying to keep yourself clean, you're licking your hands as a quarterback to be able to throw the ball or as a center to snap the ball. There just a, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, put you at risk. Travis, you announced your retirement on March 23rd, and uh, I think got a lot of fans by surprise, but obviously it was something you were thinking about for a long time. When you walked off the field your final game, did you kind of sense that that might be the last time you walk off the field as a player? No, I didn't know. I, I definitely had not made a decision, but, you know, the thoughts had started to go through my head and I was starting to consider, you know, what things looked like in the future and um, how my life could change, whether I play another year or don't play another year. And, and so uh, I tried to really take inventory those last few games and, and really through the season um, of just being thankful um, and present in those situations, you know, after spending a year off with GBS, it made me just more aware of everything that was going on and, and what it was, you know, they always say, you don't know what you have until it's gone. And, and so I was fortunate, if you will, uh, to be in a situation where it was taken away briefly and I was able to, to come back. And so I just, I really tried to soak it in uh, throughout, you know, not necessarily because the end was in sight, but, knowing that it could be taken away at any moment. And, and when you're young, when you're a young player, they always say, you know, really soak it in. You know, you don't know how long every play can be your last, but until you get faced with that situation, you sort of always feel invincible. And, um, and so that's something that I continue to stress to the young players and, uh, you know, even some of the older guys, you know, really 
cherish it and, and enjoy it because at some point it is going to be done. Was it an emotional decision for you, Travis? Not many people retire as an all pro and a pro bowler. Not many people retire after being so good at something and still being viewed as being the best, if not one of the best. Was it an emotional decision? I don't know that emotion necessarily played into it. I will tell you that it was a very long process and a lot of flip-flop and back and forth and trying to make um, an educated decision about all of the you know positives and negatives of, of, each, situ- of each situation, whether I was done or not. And, um, now, there was times where it, it became a little bit emotional, but you know, for me, you can remove emotion from a situation the more that you can organize it and spend time at thinking about it. You know, when, you, when you're going to have to make a split decision, that's when emotion gets involved, and sometimes you can make the wrong decision. So and I really did spend a, a long time thinking about it and talking about it with the people that are closest to me and some of my teammates. And, um, you know, ultimately it came to this decision. And, uh, you know, honestly, I'm as happy as I've ever been. I'm, I'm really pleased with where I'm at right now. How much uh, are you going to miss game uh, warm-up ritual, uh, your game of uh, pass and catch with Zach Martin? Some of the most incredible toe-tap end zone catches on an NFL Sunday occurred when Travis Frederick was on the receiving end of a Zach Martin pass. Yeah, that is something that uh, I will definitely miss, and I'll, I'll cherish those moments. I actually finally received – everyone got back in the building, the equipment staff was back in, and I received – a couple of boxes of things and, and in that box was the ball that Zach and I always played catch with and the brush that I used before the game to brush it. And uh, that was sort of an emotional moment for me when I opened up that box and saw it, you know, cause that's, that's one of my fond memories. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be able to, to hold that you know, moving forward. And the great thing about that is, you know, in a couple of years and many, many years when Zach decides to retire and we can get together and, and do it a little bit more, hopefully both of us have lost some weight and we can, perhaps do it at a higher level and uh, we can maybe run a little faster and do it. And, but, but it's also one of those things that I can talk to my kids about. And uh, I can, now I can start to play catch with my son a little bit more and uh, just, just enjoy. Uh, it's different. You know, it, it's, uh, it's not neither good nor bad. It's, it's just different. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next chapter here. You, you mentioned your one friend on the team. I know you, have several friends on the team, but you mentioned one in particular earlier in our interview, and obviously you're talking about Zach Martin. You guys were almost like identical twins. You were inseparable (laughs) in the locker room in the eyes of us media. Um, How does a friendship like that change? Not that it will ever weaken, and the bond, I'm sure, will be a lifelong bond, but how does it change with you segueing into the next chapter of your life and and Zach still being an active football player who seems like he has many more years to go. I think the changes are just, and we're no longer seeing each other on a daily basis. And, you know, there are things that we can no longer talk about and share the experience of. A lot of what makes that friendship so strong was that we were going through the same things and we were having trouble with the same things or we were celebrating the same things. And now um, I understand what's going on better than most people do, but I'll never truly be in that moment again uh, with him. And so now it it changes in that instead of talking about that moment as, as going through it together. Now I I move back into a supporter role where he can come to me and I can help him help him through, or when I'm having something going on, I can call him and it's just, it's just a little bit different. And then, you know, many years down the road when he pulls out and, and he's living his life after the NFL, you know, now then I'll be the teacher and I'll be able to say, listen, this is how it goes. You know, you're really going to want to, find something to do right away so you don't get too bored and you don't, you know, your wife doesn't go crazy because you're around all the time. You know, there are, uh, there are things that we're learning uh, through this process. And, and so it will, it will change and it will be dynamic, but uh, it will always be there. And, and that's something I'm sure of. So Mr. Wisconsin Badger, give me a scouting report on Tyler Biotage, who uh, as a rookie comes in here without an off season to speak of uh, and is tries to tries to win your job. <laughs> You know, I really enjoyed watching Tyler in college. Uh, I focused on the offensive line a lot when I watched those games. And you know, we weren't able to catch all the games because usually it was on travel days and whatnot. But you know, it, it's always fun to watch those Wisconsin offensive line. And, and I tell you, he is he's truly one of those guys. You know, he's a Wisconsin offensive lineman through and through. And, and what I mean by that is he's, he's tough. He uh, plays to the whistle. 
He's going to continue to to work as hard as he can. You know, he's got a, a workman's mindset and he's intelligent. You know, those are the things that, that you're going to get out of those you know, prototypical uh, guys over and over. And, you know, I've had a chance to talk to him a couple of times about different things. And you can tell he's really looking forward for the opportunity to, to go out and compete and try and learn. And, you know, there are, he's got a lot of things going for him, uh, luckily for him. And one of them is that Wisconsin runs a super similar offense to most of the pro- professional offenses. So there are going to be nuanced changes, but not sweeping changes to his technique. Um, He's got a great room that he's coming into, you know, meaning that uh, the guys that he's going to be around are going to be willing to teach him. You know, even a guy like Joe, who is going to be competing potentially for us, the same spot, those are, are people that are going to help teach him and try and make him the best that he can because the, the overall sense in that room has always been, you know, even my rookie year, uh, Phil Cost did the same thing with me. You know, whether or not it's my job or your job, we all want the group to do better. And it's a really unique group that way. And um, there's not a lot of individual um, self, you know, you know promoting and, and, and trying to push other people down. They really do want everybody to be better. And so when you're in the, in the group like that, that wants to help and is of such quality, you know, uh, the technique across the board, you know, I think that that's going to be super helpful for him. And so the fact that he wasn't able to go through a traditional off season, probably has a little less bearing on him than a lot of other people, you know, for those reasons. And so you know, I'm excited to see him get out there. You know, obviously the speed of the game is something you can't simulate in any meeting. You can't simulate um, by going through any drills by yourself. Um, but then again, you're never going to simulate that in an off season either. You know, it's not until your, your cleats hit the turf on that first game uh, that you actually find out what it's like. Travis, when it comes to the new regime for the Dallas Cowboys, you were there when Mike McCarthy, you were there in person at the Star the day Mike McCarthy was formally introduced. What's your feeling and the interaction you had before your announcement to retire? What's your feeling of the Cowboys' new regime? I'm really excited for the guys because having this new regime, is it's different. And, you know, a lot of times, like I said, being in different situations allows you to learn and grow. And so I think that that's helpful. And then, you know, getting a chance to meet Coach McCarthy and the, and the others on the coaching staff, it, it really truly seems like uh, a really great group of guys that have been put together in a very specific way. And um, I think that they can set set the team up for success. It's going to be different. You know, the the lifestyle, the the way that the practices are, the way that the, the building operates, you know, will all be different. But again, um, that provides opportunity to grow. And so there are so many older guys on that team that have been through the same thing, you know, over and over. And now this is completely new. And so uh, that's what I'm looking forward to most is seeing what that new time and new um, arrangements, what it can do for the Dallas Cowboys. All right. And one more pressing question we need to ask you, how's your dungeon and dragons game since retirement? Uh, I can say that I've been practicing a lot more and, and playing a lot more, and I've just really enjoyed it. You know, you don't always get an opportunity to do that when you're playing. There's, you know, training camp gets in the way, if you will, and uh, the, the long nights, you know, being away from the family, you don't want to take any more time. So I have gotten a chance to go out and do that uh, a lot more, and uh, I'm just really enjoying it. It's, uh, it's a really fun game, and I'm doing my best to try and share it with the world and uh, get more people involved in it. And uh, because there, it's just such a colorful and unique community. You know, there are so many different types of people that you meet and uh, it's super inclusive and, and everybody just wants to have a good time and everybody wants to, to be part of something epic. And so, uh, you know, I'm trying to spread the word and, and get more people involved. Okay. So, so what the heck is it? <laughs> I know it's been around for decades, but what in the world it is has. it? <laughs> tabletop role-playing games are uh, unique because uh, unlike video games, which are, are immersive and you're in and you get to be somebody else, video games are bound by what the story writers and the developers can put on the machine for you. But in tabletop role-playing games, the only bounds to what's going to happen is your imagination and the imagination of your game master or the person that hosts it. And so, you know, the, the person that's hosting that describes the world to you and you interact with that world uh, along with other people uh, on your on your party or sitting around the table with you. And uh, there are no bounds. You know, the, the person may say that there's a giant dragon in front of you that you're supposed to slay. And you may convince the dragon that they want to take you somewhere else so that you can go, uh, 
know, go do something completely different. And the game master had a plan for you to go this way, but you took a right turn and, and the game master comes up with something completely new on the fly. And so it's, it's really creative and it's immersive, um, imaginative. Um, and it just allows you to be somebody else or do something and get your mind off of what you're currently doing. And in situations like this that we're going through today, there are so many stressors in life, you know, whether it's trying to work from home and, uh, do something different, or maybe you lost your job, or there's uh, so many different things. And so this just gives you a couple hours to get away from it and, and enjoy and, and relax. And it's really interesting to see the range of people that do it, you know, from every sort of demographic, whether it's age or um, whether it's gender, whatever. I mean, literally everybody um, has somebody represented here. And so we see people that are our kids that are playing 18, you know, all the way up to 65, 75, people just really enjoy uh, the time. So I encourage you to try it out sometime. So, so Travis, when we try it out, as we hit our infancy on who the characters are and, and who we would identify with, can you tell us who would be Jerry Jones? Who would be Jerry Jones? Well, I think Jerry Jones would be a bard for sure. You know, the bard is a, a class that's generally throughout most of the systems. The, there are tons and tons of game systems in tabletop role-playing games. And Dungeons and Dragons is one of the most popular ones. And the bard is the leader of the group, the person that can talk you out of any situation. But the bard is also the person that provides inspiration and allows you to uh, do better at your job. The bard isn't one that's going to go out and, and actually use a sword and, and pierce the dragon. The bard is the one that's going to help everyone else be their best and, and do that. And I, so I think that that is the best way to describe Mr. Jones. So, so what role is Zeke then? Uh, Zeke is probably the berserker, uh, the berserker or the barbarian. These are a couple different classes that are like that, where uh, those people can go into a fits of rage and they become almost invincible uh, and they just continue to, to dominate the battlefield um, and, and do so um, in reckless abandon, uh, but are highly successful. Words of wisdom from the elf monk himself, Travis Frederick. <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's me. <laughs> that's beautiful. All right, Travis, we appreciate it. Hey, you, what's your playing weight now? Uh, I played about 290 right now. I'm doing yeah. my best to get down, so I'm, I'm down about 25 or 30 pounds. And, and You're looking to great. Work. Uh, yeah. and thank you very much. I appreciate Just it. Just the fact that you it's, say uh, you feel great, is that, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. It's, you're, I, didn't, you're, I didn't think I could feel this good. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize it's been so long, you know, you, you work and work and work. And also all through college, you're just always sore and all through the NFL. You continue, even when you take time off, you're still working out at a high level. Um, so you just, you're just always sore. You never know what it feels like to actually rest for extended periods of time. And it, uh, it's helped. Travis, you're, you're much too smart for this line of work. Uh, you've got much more important things to accomplish in your life, but uh, have you considered uh, broadcasting? Um, I've considered it. You know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting I said, thing. Um, I'd, be, I'd be interested at, at some point, but, you know, I, I'm not as interested in um, going out and trying to remember everyone's name and make sure that I, I have done all the research on everything, you know, so um, – and I'm sure that there's some sort of role that I can fall fall into or find uh, at some point and, and be able to, to just talk football because that's what's interesting. Yeah. Well, there needs to be a Dungeon and Dragons League, and you can be the broadcaster on that. <laughs> the commission. Well, when you when you find it, you let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to have to. All right, Travis. It. That's right. Yeah. Go ahead, Travis. Awesome. No, that's it. Yeah, I'm good. I'm done. All right, Thank Travis, you. we appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much for the time. And best wishes. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Nice talking with you guys.